especially when there are internet trolls. For instance, I got one comment on a video once when I was doing Cinnamon Spice with mm -hmm. my friend. You're going to like this very much. The comment was, even if you were naked and mute, you would still be unwatchable. <laughs> <laughs> Which Thanks. is so funny because if you break it down, it's like, <laughs> even if you were the perfect woman, naked and mute, you would still, still. be unwatchable. You're listening to The Other 50%, A Herstory of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. This is the podcast where I talk to successful women in entertainment and hear their stories. For this episode, I got to speak with Natasha Feldman. Foodies, this is the episode for you. Natasha is a chef and an actor. She has hosted the cooking shows Cinema and Spice and most recently Nosh with Tosh. And here's the thing. She's the real deal. Not only is she totally charming and great on camera, but she really knows what she's talking about. I was a little nervous about her seeing my kitchen, but she was incredibly kind and taught me many, many things. You can find us at theother50percent.com for added features, photos, show notes, and the merchandise. Please go to the website and sign up for my newsletter that keeps you posted on things like who will be in episode 100, which is two episodes away. You can also listen on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podbay, and now on Spotify and iHeartRadio and YouTube. Really, there are no excuses. Okay, here's my conversation with Natasha. Have a listen. What do you do? Like most people in this industry, I do a lot of things. Yes, everything. Um, everything, and some of the elements I think I do better than others. It's always moving and plotting and trying to get better. Um, I host and produce cooking shows. To hone my skills, I'm also a personal chef, just to make sure I'm always practicing. So you know what you're talking about? Things. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually been a driving force for me in, in this, is every step of the way thinking, I want to make sure that if I'm going to be telling people to do things that I actually know what I'm talking about, and like yeah. being very thoughtful, and reading, and researching, and testing, and doing all these things that I think is sometimes missing from cooking shows. So you're going to be an actual expert? <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> I don't know if I, I'm, I don't think I'm an actual expert, but I definitely try very hard and, you know, have gone to school and whatnot. So, yeah, I, I host, I produce, and I also do the private chef work, sort of all in this, in this vein of trying to get people to enjoy home cooking and to be more invigorated, to spend more time at home and to have more conversations around the dinner table and bring people from the outside restaurant world into their very own, you know, home versions of what a restaurant is or what they feel when they're sitting down with other people. I love it. I was just watching some of the new show you're launching right now, mm -hmm. and it, I told you when you walked through the door, it's adorable <laughs> <laughs> and so relatable, and I want to make the salad you made Yay! on the thing. It looks so delicious. Thank you. So let's talk about your show first. Yeah. Okay, what's it called? It's called Nosh with Tosh. See, that's adorable. <laughs> Um, is and that your actual kitchen, by the way? It is not. I love my kitchen at home. It has everything that I need, but it also has this terrible light-eating granite that is 18 colors of mud. <laughs> and whenever I've tried to film something there, it's like, what is the food, and what is the counter, and why are you in this weird black hole? <laughs> One day, if anyone's listening to this who wants to give me new counters... <laughs> Hook it up. That'd be a good sponsorship. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah, Caesar Stone, are you out there? Uh, so I usually rent different facilities. So for this show, since I self-produced it, it's the first thing I've ever self-produced just for funsies. That's me as a solo host. Um, I found an Airbnb that let me film there. I just was really honest with her. I was like, hey, your space is great. Can I film there? She was like, sure, why not? Women for women. Cool. It's very exciting. Um, so I rented, I rented that house in Silver Lake and to just play all weekend. It's a great looking kitchen and Thank like you. it could be yours. I know. Well, yeah. That was what I really wanted. Everything in the show was trying to get as close as humanly possible to what I think my home life feels like and what mm -hmm. cooking outside. Because when you're, when you're doing personal chef work, everything, you know, your mise en place and everything has to be like so well executed I'm and sorry, ready. Your what? Mise en place. Just, you know, before I start cooking, everything is chopped, everything is washed, everything... Mise en place is just like everything in its place, everything having an order before you start cooking. Okay. And so I wanted to remove that part of, of me, which is, you know, the really organized in-home chef part, and be like, okay, well, how do I actually cook at home? And how am I going to 
step away from that part of me and just give people an honest look of how you can sort of take the best of those elements and transform it into home cooking. So I wanted a space that felt like a place I would actually hang out. And I brought all my own stuff, like the pots and pans and dishes and whatnot. Mm -hmm. It's like, I just took my house and transported it into this lady's house. Yeah. <laughs> so when you're doing your show, so you're not putting you know, the raw thing into the oven and then one second later pulling out the cooked thing. Are you actually taking the time and making the stuff? Yes. Yeah. That was, you know, when I, when I set out to make this show, I wanted it to be the, an anti-cooking show. I wanted to take all the things that I think feel really phony and inauthentic in mm -hmm. other types of productions, write out a list of what I thought they were, and then systematically destroy them. Yeah. But keep it within the confines of a cooking show so when people watch it, they're not like, well, what is this? And I'm turned off. So it's like, how do you, I hate the word manipulate, but I think it's kind of true. How do you manipulate people into seeing something new in a way that feels very much what they're used to so that they can open their eyes and try something in a new way or like be yeah. inspired in a new way? And it's so relatable. Like, if you make a mistake or drop something, you just roll with it. Yeah. <laughs> That's, and, you know, I've, I, in most of the cooking shows that I've ever done, you know, hosted or produced, it's always, we have to, you know, especially if you're, if, if someone's giving you a lot of money, you need the right shot. So it's, okay, we're going to make each recipe four times. And each time we make the recipe, these 10 portions of the recipe will already be completed so that we can take a hero shot of it, make sure it looks perfect, yeah. and get all of this footage within this very particular amount of time so that we're not going over and we have to, you know. So it's this whole giant mess and I understand why cooking shows are what they are because of that. But I was like, wow, if I self-produce and self-fund and have my friends on this project, I can just do what I want. Like, how cool yeah. is that? Well, I think there's so many people who watch cooking shows religiously and never cook. Right. Because it's all like this perfect entertainment, but it's so perfect. You're like, well, I could never do that, but I'm going to watch this. And I had a meeting with Food Network um, a little while ago where one of the, one of the um, executives there said, our programming is great if you want to watch it with the sound on, but it's also great if you want to watch it with the sound off and just kind of like tune out and see something beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's really interesting because I, I completely understand why that's important and why that's an interesting part of food culture, that it really is calming and soothing and it makes you feel centered and it makes you feel home. But that's not what I want to do. Yeah, that's just moving art in the background. Yeah. I don't, I, I almost want people occasionally to be like, oh, that was weird. Or like, I felt a little uncomfortable or did that, is it gonna, is it gonna work? Like, do I have <laughs> to dance in the kitchen to make the salad dressing? Yes, <laughs> obviously. But I felt like I could, I felt like I could have done it after that. Yeah. But, but to your, to your question, if everything is done, you know, just if, if I sat around and waited for it, there were a few episodes where I did things in advance and I specifically called it out, like for making matzo balls. And for making uh, cookies, I think being able to rest your dough or your batter is incredibly useful mm. um, for a number of different things that happen, you know, from a... Scientifically? From a, yeah, from a, if you want to, like, you know, pull your glasses <laughs> up between your, between your eyes and... They can't see that gesture, talk about but that, that was funny. Yeah. Um, so for that, I did say, hey, this is what it looks like now, and I made one, and I refrigerated it overnight, and this is what it looks like now, because you don't have... 48 hours to sit here. Right. That's me. a lot of production time to wait for dough to rise. Yeah. I don't have that kind of money. <laughs> <laughs> i got to change outfits between segments. I can't just. That's right. So for those, I did do call outs, but everything else was just, you know, while we were waiting for the thing to cook, we would just turn off the camera and hang out and sit down as the crew and have a drink or talk about something else or talk about the next segment. And it made it feel very community oriented mm -hmm. and fun and I just let everyone kind of do what they wanted to do with it. Like, this is, this is like the nucleus. This is the goal. And I hired everyone that I really trust. So I was like, okay, so you're just going to do this thing with this nucleus of an idea at the center. And then I, like, can't wait to see it. But I didn't even want to, like, look at what the cinematographer was doing. I was like, just, you know, do you. Have fun with it. Cool. So I would set it up and make sure it all looked right and then be like, go. Just have How big was do. your crew? I had a um, cinematographer and... Um, he brought along with him a camera operator and then a sound guy and a friend, a friend makeup artist came on one day. The other day I was like, oh, <laughs> smudge. Okay. I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. 
But with the, I honestly wanted that to be a part of it too. It's like you're not going to wake up and look great every day. So on mm. on some of the episodes I look done, and on some of the other ones it's like, oh yeah, you are literally at home cooking, looking like in your slippers. Yeah. Actually, in my slippers. The way I record hair. podcasts, in yeah. my slippers. I love these slippers, by the way, with the pom-pom, the Thank multicolored you. pink pom-pom. Okay, let's talk about your journey, how you found this. Because you started out as an actor, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. What happened? The old tale of an actor. That's right. So I am still obsessed with acting and the idea of finding... Um, that. You know, as, as, as there is a center of a recipe or, like, a center theme when you want to make a show, there's also, like, I think, you know, a center to every character. And what is the same about all of those things, I think, is very fascinating. Mm-hmm. And as an actor, I had a perspective that was slightly different than a lot of the people in my program and school. And I always felt like I didn't exactly fit in. And while I loved the performing elements of it, all of the other 90% of the, the hustling and the acting classes and all of that, I didn't derive very much pleasure from. So I was like, okay, well, if the majority of what this is you're not deriving pleasure from, then you should probably <laughs> find something else to do. Maybe it's not for you. Probably not for you. Um, that being said, you know, I, I studied at La Jolla Playhouse and I taught the young performers workshop at La Jolla Playhouse and that was my first experience teaching Mm -hmm. and I was like oh there's something like in this that I really like like that and then I went to this cool theater in um, downtown San Diego called Diversionary it's an LGBT theater Mm -hmm. and they put on the craziest best programming all having to do with you know issues inside of their community and so I was in um, a version of Jane Anderson's Looking for Normal which was turned into oh, a yeah, yeah. movie with, with uh, Tom Wilkinson and Jessica Lange. I worked on that movie. You did? <laughs> I did. <laughs> I'm obsessed with that movie. We did it at HBO. So I was in this production of that, and as um, I played the daughter, mm-hmm. the one, you know, going through puberty. Yeah, yeah. But in the play, she's a much larger role than in the movie. And so in that process, we started going to all these, um, we would take meetings with people in the trans community just talking about their experiences and getting to know them, and that idea of the story being less about the internal character, but expressing this larger outcry is not a word, but trying to take other people's perspectives and then use your character to create empathy in the world Mm -hmm. for a community that doesn't necessarily get the exposure to be able to do that. Yeah. It's like, oh, that's really interesting. That's the whole point of all of it. And that was sort of the first seedling to me being like, oh, I kind of want to make, I kind of want to find a way to like make videos or, or find a way that's more, maybe more expressive or larger than theater, because mm-hmm. the com- theater goers community is very small and honestly, very much a welcoming community. So I was, sort of felt like I'm preaching to the choir, which is great. Right. But I was like, hmm, this is this is interesting. So I was kind of like picking up all of these little seedlings along the way, and then I went to um, in college. I went to the royal the Royal Academy has like a little arm. Mm-hmm. called Bada, the British American Drama Academy, and I was there studying Shakespeare, and I fell in love with the borough market. So instead of, like, memorizing my lines, I was, like, picking up leeks and all these crazy things and, like, <laughs> shoving them in my backpack and taking them the tube with crazy vegetables. And everyone's like, are you going to, like, rehearse with me, or are you just going to stand know, there making and soup. learn how to make bread? Because <laughs> that has nothing to do with this program. So was, I think it was sort of, like, those fundamental elements. I was like, hmm, the teaching... Hmm, the storytelling, hmm, the food. How do I Put all that tie together. all these things together? So then after college, I was like, I'm going to go to culinary school. And I started teaching cooking classes because I loved that, and it sort of snowballed, and my friend and I made a show for YouTube, and Yahoo bought it. I hate when I tell these stories, and it sounds like it's been so easy, like just yada, 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 yada <laughs> snowball, snowball, snowball. That sounded really easy. No, it's like, been really hard. Let, <laughs> really let's pause gnarly. for a moment on the you produced a show and Yahoo bought it. <laughs> That, were there any more steps to that? or <laughs> Yes, many, including a lot of stalking, sending um, T-shirts and emails and gifts and asking a billion other people who, who didn't want to do it, you know, mm-hmm. so, and eventually finding someone who was like, okay, fine, we'll <laughs> stop Will that make us. you stop calling us? <laughs> yes. We'll take it. Um, and so then subsequently just picking up, you know, more gigs and trying to sort of level up each time, which doesn't happen very easily and 
um, you know, it's a slow crawl, but but it's really it's really worth it and and really exciting. What was the Yahoo show? Can we find it? Yeah, it's called Cinema and Spice, and their recipe is <laughs> inspired by movies and TV shows. And I made it with one of my best that friends. That is so cute. And uh, it's really dorky. So if you, <laughs> if you like, like what for example? <laughs> um, like Annie Hall and black and white cookies mm -hmm. and cocktails with Dr. Brown cream soda, or Miyazaki Spirited Away with um, bento boxes, like how to make your own really good teriyaki. Yeah. Or uh, what was. Raised in Arizona and baby sized Southwestern foods. <laughs> or, <laughs> uh, you know. That's so fun. Just whatever we felt like. <laughs> really. That is so great. There are a few episodes that we never did because we disagreed on what we wanted. I always wanted to do Blade Runner and food out of those takeout containers, like the white takeout containers. Yeah. And Juliana always wanted to do Tempopo, which is a, um, I think, is it a Japanese hill? It's like a pretty. Sounds like it. It's a, you know, like a film student wet dream. <laughs> and I was like, this, this movie is gross. I don't want to do that. So those were the two. Someday maybe we'll you both can do, do those both? two. Well, Yahoo was also not down with either of them. So <laughs> there's Okay, that. fair. Fair. <laughs> Whatever. The people but, with the money, I guess. Ugh, good to have a say. People with the money. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what else can we say about this current show that you're doing? Where is it? What's happening? So I feel like I haven't even really explained what the show is. Oh, yeah. Let's start there. Sorry, everyone. I feel like everybody watched the first episode with me this morning. <laughs> right? Yeah. <No. laughs> so, Not With Tosh is a cooking show that's specifically intended for busy people who are great at a lot of things, who have sophisticated palates or know really good food, but don't necessarily know how to cook it. And I wanted to create something that was really honest and... Uh, felt very personal to me and was inviting people into my kitchen to drop expectation and drop the fear of something going wrong and learn to embrace the entire experience of cooking. And that is the mistakes and that is the learning curve and that is all the funny things that happen along the way that almost always lead to something that is at minimum edible. You know? Yeah. It's like at best it's exceptional, which oftentimes it is if you have just practiced a few times. And then you're surprised. You throw all those things together and, oh my God, it tastes so good. And it makes you feel so good about yourself. Yeah, you've really done something. It's, I think, if you can, if you can feed yourself and feed your family, it is this, it is like a, a little bit of gratitude that you show for yourself and for other people that at the end of the day you can feel really positive. And, and I love that it is instant gratification, unlike most other things in the world. You start <laughs> off with a few ingredients and then an hour later you have dinner and it's, it's and very gratifying. Good. I, I think that's why, like, the Blue Aprons and all that stuff is so popular right now. Yeah. Because they make it so easy to have that sense of accomplishment, like, you really cook something. They do. Good. My, but you don't even need all that. No. And, and my issue with companies like Blue Apron, sorry, is that I think it They're almost, not going to sponsor your show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? It almost encourages people to not learn how to cook. It, mm -hmm. Everyone that I know that's done it, because the ingredients come and it has a set of instructions and all the recipes are relatively complex, you learn how to make that dish. Yeah. And what I wanted to do is say, well, screw that. If you're going to know how to pan sear something, now you know how to pan sear everything. If I'm going to teach you how to roast a vegetable, now you basically know how to roast every vegetable. So you can take these skill sets and then extrapolate them to make whatever you want. And a lot of these things, although they're simple, are also the dishes that my clients ask me for. Mm -hmm. Like billionaires also want chicken tenders or <laughs> pan-seared fish or, you know, whatever it is. So it's... They it, also have kids who are only going to eat white yeah, food. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's really cool to be able to say, yeah, some people want to pay you to do this, but also you can do this yourself. Like it's very empowering to feel like you have the capability to have the same quality food that people who want to pay for a private or personal chef would have. Yeah, I mean, and getting back to that salad I watched today, I'm going to be like this after every single episode. <laughs> I'm going to talk about it for a week. Because, you know, I have two ingredients in my fridge for a salad. You know, I have, I have arugula because I'm fancy like that. Yes, of course. And I have a cucumber and I may have some tomatoes. And if I'm you really super salad. fancy, I'll throw in some beets. But you threw in a thousand things that so simple but so doable and it was the most beautiful salad in the world. Thanks. Yeah, I, I'm really into the kitchen sink salad. I think you can make a delicious salad with just arugula and a dressing. People always think you need a billion ingredients, but the reality is 
you just need a decent vinaigrette. But what I wanted yeah. to show with that salad is I wanted to, because it does have, I don't know, 15 different ingredients mm -hmm. in it, and then the salad dressing. The idea isn't you're going to have all these things. It's, you might have one or two or three of them. Or when you go to the store, you might be inspired to pick something up that you haven't tried before. And that was sort of what I wanted to get people thinking about while watching it. You can it. grab all the stuff in your fridge and throw it in a salad. Yeah. Maybe not raw meat. <laughs> <laughs> but Maybe seared lightly. Yeah. <laughs> you can throw it on top. Not raw so meat. So true. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> Buttermilk? No. Um, what are yeah. some of the other things? Because I haven't watched all the episodes yet. So... I've been referencing this pan-seared whitefish. Yeah. It's my next episode, and I'm obsessed with pan-seared whitefish because you can throw it on a salad, you can put it in a taco, you can have it on a rice bowl, and then you know how to pan-sear anything. Um, and I also think it's a really good way to keep your fish moist and to give it a nice caramelization or crisp on the outside. Okay, because talk a little bit more about that because okay. my fish either comes out mm -hmm raw in the middle, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or so overcooked, I don't want to serve it to anybody. What kind of fish are you cooking? Salmon, usually. Okay, what kind of salmon? Wild <laughs> Alaskan salmon. <laughs> cool, cool. Well, different, great choice, by the way. Thank you. Thank but you. different salmons have different fat contents. The fattier the fish, the harder it is to overcook it because it's going to taste really like luscious and mm -hmm. unctuous and fatty regardless of what you do, which kind of tricks your brain into thinking it is moisture. You know how the white stuff comes up? The albumin? What is that? That, it shouldn't happen. It happens every <laughs> single time. Okay. <laughs> that I'm so glad you stopped by. Is al I think it's called albumin. It could be something else with an A. That could be what's an egg white. I don't know. Anyways, what that means is when you heat the fish too quickly, it starts excre excreting that sort of white yeah. gunk, which is essentially like the muscles and the proteins and everything just being forced to squeeze themselves tightly too quickly. And so you usually end up with something that is kind of rubbery. So I'm cooking it too hot? Too hot, yeah. What's the right temperature for salmon? So if you're going to... Do it in the oven. I usually turn the oven off all the way to 500 or however high your oven goes. Uh -huh. So it's really preheated very nicely. Then you put a little olive oil, whatever you want on, on your fish. You stick it in the oven. You immediately turn it down to 350. So it kind of like crisps the outside and then finishes cooking a little bit slower. Mm -hmm. The other thing is all proteins will continue to cook once you take them out of the oven. So I always like undercook things slightly, take them out of the oven, and then let them rest. Because the temperature is going to continue to increase. Yeah. And the other thing is a lot of people are very scared to undercook foods, but if you get good quality food, it's usually not a big deal if you eat it a little undercooked. I mean, most chefs undercook everything. Well, there's actually this amazing book called The Food Lab. Yeah. You read it by no. Genji Alt. He is this crazy, crazy chef who basically goes like deep dive into all the science behind every single thing you've ever put in your mouth and beyond. And I'm obsessed with him. And in this book, he has this whole chapter about uh, protein temperatures and how we have sort of been trained to think, okay, well, your chicken has to be 165 degrees in order to be edible because if not, you're going to get food poisoning. And yeah, he says true. it's actually a lot about rest. The, you have to cook the meat to a certain temperature and then let it rest a certain time before it is safe. So your meat cooked at 165 degrees has the shortest resting period. However, if you were to cook the breast to an internal temperature of 150 degrees and you let it rest just slightly longer, which you let it rest anyways, it's technically equally as safe. Oh. I mean, I haven't done my own research on that, but this guy is pretty dang smart. And I always undercook things slightly. Like, I cook my chicken to, like, 155, knowing that it's going to rest and come to 160 or 162 because an overcooked chicken breast is sad. <laughs> Back to your fish though. You can also, I, like that's why I love pan searing. Okay, let's talk more about that. you get, the, the trick with pan searing and not having it stick is just making sure your pan is hot enough and the oil is hot enough. Because you don't want the, the fish will almost like fuse with the pan mm -hmm. if it's not hot enough. So you want to get it really hot so then it sort of fuses to itself rather than the pan. So you get the pan screaming hot and then as soon as the fish is in, then you can turn it down. And what kind of oil? 
We always, well, not olive oil. If you're gonna get anything really hot on the stove, you wanna use something that has a high smoke point, which would be a safflower oil or a canola oil or, you know, something okay. more like that. So olive oil's gonna start smoking and cause burning. It's making me realize I know nothing. Okay. <laughs> Then what? That's why I'm here to help. <laughs> oh my god. Then you just you know so many things. No. You just wait till your pan's really hot and then you put the fish in and what I think is so one of the things that I think is so fun about cooking is this really quick transformation mm -hmm. and being able to quickly assess like when something is done and when you like, like now's like, the you're like a private eye. He's like, "Okay, now I know. This piece of the puzzle is done." I collected a clue. <laughs> well, so when the fish, you know, it's obviously going to bubble around it, and then when it starts to caramelize up the sides, you call it unilateral cooking when you can see something cooking from the bottom up. Uh huh. So it'll, you know, you'll see that its its color um, is very different to the bottom of the fish than the top of the fish, and it, you'll see that it's starting to brown or caramelize or you know whatever you'd like to call it around the bottoms of the fish, and then you know it, you, it's time to flip it. So then it'll be like beautifully. Should it be brown. halfway up or like just starting to come? That kind of depends on the fish and exactly what the heat is. What you're really looking for is more that you can see like the caramelization on the outside of the protein. So when you look at, if you're looking at your fish in the pan and mm -hmm. you can see that it's like really golden on the bottom, then you want to flip. Okay. And then you just do the same thing on the other side. And then you're done? And then you're probably done. You know, if then you can, if then the outside of the fish is all one color, depending on how you like it to be prepared, it's either done or if you want it to be a little bit more cooked, more to the well done side, then I just turn the heat down and just let it cook for another two minutes or so. Or you can preheat the oven and just throw it in the oven for a minute while you finish other things up and then everything's done at once. Huh. And you can do that for any kind of fish. Yeah, basically. Salt, Except pepper? Except always. Okay. Must have the salt and pepper. Jacobson salt if you want the best salt. Okay. It's from Portland. <laughs> Where all the best things come from. Obviously. Depending on the fish. Because some fish are obviously much more delicate, like a sole mm -hmm. or a rainbow trout, you know? Yes. Fall apart. Yeah, so that's why I do the pan searing, like in the video, where I do a light flour coating. Because that also helps it, it not stick. Mm -hmm. So I take a Ziploc bag and you throw flour and then whatever seasonings you want, salt and pepper, you shake the fish. You dance with the fish? Like the old, dun, dun, dun. what was that? Shake and bake? Shake and bake. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. They were on to something, I guess. It's shake and bake and I helped. <laughs> yeah, so then you shake it in the bag and then you do the same thing with the oil. But that also will help it not stick for a more delicate fish. And you got to have a fish spatula. Hmm. I know it sounds crazy, but you're going to use it all the time. What does it look like? It is a thinner, longer metal spatula with holes long great holes uh -huh. in it so that none of the oil comes up with the fish but I, I use it for like pancakes I use it because it's really thin and pliable and they're cheap you can get them on Amazon for like four dollars and it's a cooking instrument that you'll use for much more than fish okay what else is a must-have thing in my kitchen uh you will you must have a good olive oil for salad dressings Trader Joe's olive oil what kind I'm gonna show it to you yeah let's see <laughs> Let me put down my mic. <laughs> Luckily, we do this. Let all my oil. <laughs> oh, premium. Where did it come from? I don't know. Yeah, we don't know. Italy. It says Italy. It came from the small town of Italy. And Monrovia, <laughs> California. <laughs> so I don't know anything about that olive oil. But Italy, Spain, Argentina, and Greece. That's a lot of places where your olives came from. That's weird to put them all together from all those places. It's actually quite common. It's also common for olive oil to not be 100% olive oil. What else might be in there? Like filler oils? Yeah, uh, and yeah, exactly. Just to make it less expensive for them and more expensive for you. Okay. Larger profit. Margins. You know, I have an olive tree in my backyard. Well, Should I be harvesting those yes, olives and gorgeous. dancing on my own olive oil? <laughs> uh, I wish I was that kind of person <laughs> who would actually do that. Oh, yeah. I have that kind of time. I'm going to do that. But I love California Olive Ranch olive oil. Actually, I've, I've seen it at Costco, but it's... Primarily at health food markets, like a Whole Foods or a Sprouts, uh -huh. or it's not at Trader Joe's. They might be at larger grocery stores now, too. You can also get it on Amazon. But all of the olives come from their ranch in California, and it's not terribly expensive, and the quality is so good. And it's like a really beautifully grassy olive oil, but it's not too pungent. So I use that for any salads or roasting, and then the you know, you need the high heat oil for everything else. Talk to me about 
coconut oil because you hear so much jibber jabber. We should do, cook everything in coconut oil. We should yeah. never use coconut oil. You should swish it in your mouth. Like oil pulling? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried that. It didn't and? like it. <laughs> I don't think it made your teeth as white as a Crest White Strip would. One. Fair. Um, coconut oil. Well, let me step one, let me go one step further away from the olive oil into fad diets in general. And yes. then I'll get to coconut oil. Yeah, yeah. I, as part of, you know, I, I, like it's so many steps back that it like almost <laughs> goes back into like the difference between men and women. I don't like, I don't even. Let's go there. There is so much research and about literally anything in any sphere, but particularly in food. And there's so much research that is incredibly biased. Mm -hmm. And there's so much research that is fact one day and then fiction the next. Oh, and every 10 years it completely contradicts yeah. itself. And then there are so many fad diets that work for some people and not for other people. And the more that, especially in Los Angeles, you know, where we have places like Moon, Moon Juice where people are buying sex dust and all these things that have... <laughs> weird mushrooms in them to, you know, boost their libido or whatever. I'm like, I don't, I, uh, should you even be eating that mushroom? I don't know. <laughs> like, who told you? Who did this research? Yeah. We have these, these iconic food celebrities who just go we around talking about things willy-nilly. And then the next thing you know, everyone's drinking ashwagandha. And <laughs> I can't even pronounce it. <laughs> so, regarding coconut oil, <laughs> I tend to... Be really nervous of anything that's a huge fad and anytime anyone starts doing everything with one ingredient because when you step too far away from moderation, I think you get into a danger zone. Yeah. So that being said, I use coconut oil a lot for baking because it is delicious. Because it is delicious. Yeah, it adds really nice flavor, especially my mom is dairy-free. So I use it as, as a butter substitute mm. in a lot of baked goods for her. So it's very useful. I have also used it as lotion <laughs> when I ran out of lotion. And it smells delicious. It's delicious. <laughs> and as far as I can tell, it works just like lotion. Yeah. Uh, that being said, I did try to use it on my face once and it broke me out. So maybe don't do that. <laughs> maybe a little too much of the face. <laughs> yeah. Although I just tried the coconut whipped cream at Trader Joe's. Pretty good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There was nothing wrong with that. <laughs> So, you know, I know people do stir fry with coconut oil and I have done that in the confines of curries mm -hmm. and other sort of like Indian or Thai foods where yeah. the coconut flavor is really nice. But I found in other things when I've tried using it, I, it it's like a, a flavor that I don't necessarily want. If I use it for anything, my kids will reject. <laughs> They'll be like, you cooked this in coconut oil. It's no, over. No, I didn't. <laughs> I'm like, no. No, I didn't. Like, You're yeah, imagining things again, You did, Paula. and we're not eating it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Dang it. Make your own dinner. <laughs> so, coconut oil. You know, if you love it, go for it. But I think if... If you're doing anything because somebody told you to, especially in food, you should do a little bit more research. Yeah. If you think it's now the holy grail. Yeah. It's pause, probably not. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, if, you know, they're like, five years ago, they were like, you can only eat 10 almonds a day because they're so fattening. If you eat 11 almonds, you're going to blow up like a balloon. And now people are saying, eat as many nuts as you want. Like, all the good fat. Yeah, that's not good either. I tried the eat as many nuts as you want diet. <laughs> it did not go well. Yeah, I find that when I do the, quote, eat as many nuts as you want diet, I'm incredibly gassy, so I don't do that. Yeah, it's not all as cracked up to be. <laughs> no. Although it is delicious. Yes. And when I was pregnant, I would eat, like, one of those giant bags of chocolate-covered almonds almost every day. Well, chocolate, also, quote, good for you. Yeah. Although, did you see the giant article that came out not that long ago about how a lot of the research on dark chocolate has been funded by chocolate companies, <laughs> i.e., Nestle and others. I reject that article. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is interesting. Yeah, it's like. But really, I, dark chocolate is kind of is good for you, though, isn't it? I don't. I don't, don't know. Don't crush my dreams. I don't know. I think anything that isn't totally harmful that makes you feel good is like a win. Yeah. So for that, I say chocolate is good for you. But is it actually going to make you live longer and have a healthier heart? 
We'll see. I don't know. Because how are you going to know if it was the chocolate or the wine at the end of the day how when you would get you there? Know? Yeah. <laughs> like, well, it's 110. I'm pretty sure it was the combination <laughs> of the wine and the chocolate. <laughs> Must have been. <laughs> Couldn't have been the positive thinking and the loving family. And the meditation. And the meditation. All of that. Maybe the exercise. It was none of those. None of those things. No. The chocolate and the wine. Uh, and a lot of it is just your genes, you know? It really is. In the land of L.A. and everybody's on some kooky diet or cleanse mm -hmm. or whatever, how do you eat? What do you think about all that? I have been very lucky in that my parents have always been sort of hippie granola weirdos. Mm -hmm. So I grew up with a lot of very healthy food. So I'm lucky in that. A lot of brown bread. A lot of brown bread. A lot of vegetables. So I'm lucky in that I like Vegetables, it's not like a, a challenge to eat them, so I'm excited about salads and greens and all those things like a weirdo. That being said, um, I think the more you know about cooking and the more you want to experiment with things, the more you get into butter, dairy, all the delicious things land. Mm -hmm. So I've sort of, I sort of waffle back and forth. Sometimes I eat really decadent food all the time and then after a few weeks I'm like oh I don't feel particularly good I'm gonna go back to the way that my parents eat and then I eat hippie granola salads mm -hmm. and then I get bored of that and then I, so I do this sort of like waffling back and forth thing but I would guess you're not eating a lot of processed packaged no food unless but you know it's also when you're on set everything goes out the window because you're just trying to eat Quickly. Right. So are you doing a cooking show like eating craft service? Yes. Like eating licorice as you're making your salad? Yes. <laughs> I mean, one of the things also that I loved about doing this show is that every single thing was eaten on set. Yeah. So all the food, as soon as we cut the cameras, we would eat it all. And it, and it But then also, you know, you just want crunchy, salty, sweet snacks on set. You just do. Hershey's Miniatures and Diet Coke. Yeah. So it was a healthy combination of crafty <laughs> snacks and the dishes we are preparing balance balance but i do think that is that has sort that is the key is just balancing the really decadent stuff for me at least balancing the dishes that feel incredibly comforting and really the pinnacle of delicious but then also you know eating eating some salads what's your position on organic oh my gosh this is this is the biggest fight that my boyfriend and i have because <laughs> oh let's go there he just doesn't necessarily believe that organic food is better for you. He's like, show me the, show me the research that cannot be argued with. And I'm like, oh, I can't do that. Show me the study funded by Monsanto. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I try to buy as much as I can at the farmer's market and support local farmers and eat as much organic as I can. One, because I assume that it, because it, has, it comes from soil that's more nutrient dense than it is. It and, seems like it's better. It tastes better. And that is, that's my number. That's where I always win the argument. I'm like, taste this organic carrot and then taste your crappy conventional yeah. carrot. Taste Andy. organic beef. Taste yeah. So I can't even eat, I can't even eat non-organic <laughs> beef. I mean, I realize how that sounds. But having someone who didn't eat beef for 25 yeah. years, it tastes so gross to me unless it's grass-fed. I, uh, yeah. You can totally tell. You can. I think you can, and almost... Almost every food, if you really close your eyes and you taste the two next to each other, you can taste a difference. So I try to buy as much organic as I can just because I try to support industries that I think are doing positive things. And generally speaking, using less pesticides, growing things the way that they were intended to be grown. And especially biodynamic farming, as much as I can support those things, I try to. That being said, I also don't, I'm not crazy about it. So when I go out to eat, I will go, you know, wherever my friends want to go, or if we're on a road trip, I'll eat whatever is there. Pass the Pringles. Yeah, I pass them Pringles. It's not like that uh, Portlandia episode where they leave the restaurant to go to the farm to see. <laughs> where what was the chicken's name? <laughs> yeah, but you know, growing up in Portland, like there's definitely like that hit. Like I got that. Yeah, I have to work. Oh, you grew up in Portland. Yeah, I have to kind of fight it a little bit to be like, was this cow named Joan? And I grew up in Seattle. We're oh, like that about mm -hmm. coffee. Yes. Where were the beans from? What was the beans name? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pacific Northwest. We're all about it. So moderation. Moderation. And doing what you can. Everyone's circumstances are different and I think everyone tries to pitch in and do the right thing and that's sort of what I, that's like my vote. I try to 
by biodynamic and sustainable and organic and all that when I have the luxury of being able to do that. But I think if you're cooking at home, no matter what it is, you know, knowing what is going into your food is a thousand times better than not. Organic yeah. or non-organic or Monsanto, whatever, you know. And I think that's sort of like the commonality of what I try to get at in this show is it's like, just do it. Like whatever you've got at home or whatever grocery store you have accessible to you or whatever is in your friend's fridge, like let's figure out how to cook it and make you feel good about it. Yeah. And give you a good time. Okay, I think we have just proven that you are the real deal. <laughs> that this is your Happy? passion and your life <laughs> and that you're not just hosting a cooking show that someone else is producing. Yeah. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? This is your baby and your passion. Are you going to write a cookbook? I would like to. It's very hard to get someone to want you to write a cookbook. Well, I think as you build your platform, I, yeah. mean, I, I mean, I realize I just met you, but I think you're like the next Nigella or the next... Oh my God. You're like the next food person. Thanks. And I've I mean, discovered you in my dining room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, every, I've actually been thinking about that a lot while I was making all the recipes for this show. I wanted everything to be documented just so that if somebody was like, hey, let's give you a cookbook tomorrow, it's like, here it is. Yeah. It's all how I want it to be written. Here are the photographs. Here's what it looks like. Here's the... You're ready. Yeah. I mean, you're already doing the work. You may as well document it. Yeah. So I would love that. And, you know, I think just any, any opportunities that there are to get more people to see that there are more ways to cook than this Instagram perfect... As much as I love Martha Stewart and think she's a, a god on this earth, <laughs> I also think that she's, she makes food look intimidating. Yeah. It's all so perfect. And it just, it seems like if she touches something, it looks, it looks like it was sculpted out of, out of gold. Right. Like if Martha Stewart came over, what are you going to serve Martha Stewart? You're going to cry <clears throat> in the corner. Yeah. There's no <laughs> serving anything. Like I feel like I could make you a sandwich and it's not going to be as good as the sandwich you're going to make, but I think you'd eat it. Yeah, I would. <laughs> 100%. I would eat it. And I, would, I love when other people cook me food. It's very, it, you know, it's how I show people that I love them. It's like my love language. So when people make food for me, even if they don't love me, I'm like, oh, they love me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and you're not judging them. No. I'm like, oh, oh hmm, your ratio of mayonnaise to mustard was not perfect. <laughs> Yeah, what kind of mustard was that? <laughs> <laughs> did you make your mayonnaise by yourself, or did you buy it from? Did you make your mayonnaise? <laughs> Who out there is making their mayonnaise? A lot of people. Really? Mm -hmm. It's actually. Are you making your mayonnaise? You're making your mayonnaise. No, but I can. Okay. I've had in culinary school. That's one of the things they torture you with making mayonnaise. I'm not even sure how to say may like mayonnaise. I'm feeling very self conscious even saying the word mayonnaise. Mayonnaise. <laughs> yeah, you plug your nose. It sounds really cool too. <laughs> Um, I keep realizing I'm looking at that plant because it's so pretty. It's a stargazer lily because well, those are the best smelling things in the world. I know I'm a little intimidated actually that you're looking into my kitchen because it's looks like a kitchen. It's it looks a like little literally everyone's kitchen. kitchen, including mine. Okay, that makes me feel better. You got some dishes that are washed and ready to be put away. You have some delicious fruit that's about to be consumed, and you French pressed your own coffee. What I'm seeing is an impressive kitchen. You are the <laughs> nicest. Do you hear her? <laughs> All right, let's back to you. Um, what is your big hope for the show, for your career? Like, what is your master plan? Well, since I already mentioned Martha Stewart, I'll go back to Martha Stewart. Are you the next Martha Stewart? I would love that. <laughs> the anti-Martha? No, I think in some ways, yeah, I think what she has been able to do to inspire people to live that very particular put-together perfect life that makes some people feel really, really, really great. I think there's this vast landscape of people that don't fit into that bucket, and I want to be the basket for those people. Or it's like, I'm going to show, I would like to show you how to do these things for people that are busy and have lives and kids and families. and yeah, who have jobs and then come home and make dinner. Yeah, it's like, okay, well, if you actually only have 20 minutes to make dinner... Like, what can we make? Or what could you have made that's in your freezer? Or, you know, how, how can I help you figure out to cook something for dinner that then you can bring to work for lunch tomorrow? Or something that you can make for dinner tonight and then add a few things in for your dinner tomorrow night. Like, what are the ways that we can actually 
think through this thing together and come up with sustainable ways to have a healthier home life. Yes. What do you think about meal planning? Like, are you uh, on Sunday, I'm going to make my plan and make my list and get everything for the week? Or are you, I'm going to go pick up the ingredients every day? I wish I was that person. <laughs> <laughs> that person's amazing. I also think that person's person is kind of a Martha Stewart. Someone who can sit down on Sunday and be like, okay, well, I know I'm going to be home this night, this night, and this night. And I know that I have meetings on this day, this day, and this day. Therefore, I'm going to create lunches for Monday and Thursday, and I'm going to get groceries for Tuesday and Wednesday. And, like, that is so much thought already that it well, hurts my brain. Well, I'm just thinking, when I was working full-time, and I'm a single mother of three, I'm only going to the grocery store once a week because yeah. I don't have any other time. So... I, I plan, okay, I'm, we're, we're going to do pasta, taco night, pizza, and chicken. Yeah. And, that, and that's as far as I could do. Right. But I'm shopping on Sunday. Yeah. Then the extra step of, am I going to make something nice or different or interesting or put it all together in some other way, like, that is just right. beyond me. So that's... Like, if you could make that simple, <laughs> I would eat it up. Well, and that's why I think that the idea of meal prep and knowing exactly what you're going to eat every night is kind of an exhausting way to phrase it but if you're just thinking if you're flipping through some recipe ideas on Sunday and you're like oh this looks good and this looks good and this looks good so I'm going to get the I'm going to get the ingredients for these things and oh at the bottom I see that there's you know other dishes that might go well with it and then you're you have the ingredients to make you know five or six dishes and then there are tips on how to kind of convert those into other meals it sort of unfolds itself in a way that feels much more organic and easy rather than knowing I'm going to have this thing this night and then it's going to do this and this and this and this and It's so much it more interesting than I'm going to make a giant chicken on Sunday and then we're just going to eat chicken every day this week. Yeah. The same exact way. Which, if that's what it takes and that's what you can handle, then that's great. And I hope that watching the videos and sort of learning new techniques is, gives people different ways to think about that one chicken that they made and different mm -hmm. things that they can do along the way. But I want to encourage people to just, instead of laboring over one dish and then stretching it out, to make things that are really easy, that once you make them five or six times, you kind of remember how to do them and then you can get excited about trying different spices or adding different variations onto that thing and having a larger arsenal of incredibly easy dishes. Yes. Amen. Okay, five things I should have in my kitchen. Olive oil, I'll give you the one. Okay, really good salt. I think, you know, like a, a, coarser, a coarser sea salt, like a Maldon or a, or a Jacobson or something like that. The kind that you keep in a bowl and then pinch? Yeah, exactly. That makes uh, me feel like a chef, by the way, <laughs> when I have my yeah, bowl of salt. Just a little. Um, one, for me, I think when I, I I'm, I'm less of an overuser of salt when I use sea salt mm -hmm. and especially in salads and stuff since they're all like a little bit different sizes it makes your greens taste delicious makes everything taste delicious makes everything taste delicious and it's something that feels kind of luxurious that is inexpensive yeah and it also makes if you put a little bit of it on top of your food at the end it makes it look really nice so now you've just sprinkled something on top with one second and you feel like you did something sophisticated Totally. And I'm all about sophistication with ease. Also, other things that I always think you should have on hand is an herb. Like one fresh herb. I think a fresh herb makes everything taste better. It kind of doesn't matter what it is. Like cilantro, dill, parsley, mint, basil, whatever. I keep like one fresh herb at least all the time. Okay, we were up to olive oil, salt, <laughs> and herbs. herb. Mm -hmm. a, a good pan. Okay, what makes a good pan? A thick, heavy pan. Um, Teflon or no Teflon? All Clad actually makes this really amazing pan set. You can get them at Bed Bath & Beyond, and they're I, I, something ridiculous, like $50 for the two pans. Mm -hmm. And they're All Clad. It's their less expensive version, so they don't have like the you know center copper piece that keeps the heat conducting exactly evenly. But they're really good, and it has like a non-Teflon Teflon, so you can cook basically anything on them because nothing sticks. So they're oh. perfect for omelets or... You but know. it doesn't then flake off and kill you? Yeah. Okay. They're fantastic. And then if you want to splurge, getting a 
getting like one really nice regular all-clad pan or something that is like this has the stainless top exterior but is really heavy and conducts heat well and then I think one Dutch oven and that that's like a if you've got like a few good pans in one Dutch oven they're great yeah and you can cook just about anything in them and I love those because then you can serve straight from them yes and they're pretty yeah people want to have this argument that you know it's ridiculous to buy things for your kitchen that are expensive but what's ridiculous is buying a Teflon pan that's going to last you eight months, then you get a scratch in it, then you can't eat it because you're exposed to the chemicals in it, and then it goes in a landfill, and then you buy another pan, and then you keep repeating the process every yes. year. And then you've spent $400 on a Teflon pan. Yes. When you can buy one pan for $80 and, and keep just it keep it. Yeah. So yeah. I don't really understand. I mean, I do understand because the cost is up front, but if you take a step back, it, make, it just doesn't make any sense to me that you would want to, like, keep spending money on crappy things. Yes. And it's just changing your mindset a little bit and saving longer for the one thing rather than continuing to buy it and spending more over time. Amen. Amen. Let's talk for a moment about the state of women in the entertainment industry. Okay. What are you seeing? What do you think about it? Well, from, from food, I think it's very interesting that... We have societally created this environment where men are chefs mm -hmm. and women are home cooks. Right. And Is that changing, do you think? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I think especially in Los Angeles, we have some very sophisticated female chefs who are kicking everybody's asses. And I wonder what the environment in their kitchens is like. Better, I'm sure. Yeah. From people that I know that have either worked with them or been around them, you know, it's... It's an, it's an insane idea that you have to yell at your staff to get them to do anything in a restaurant. Because if you just, I studied interpersonal psychology in college because I'm a weirdo. And, I'm, and after doing that and then seeing men yelling in their kitchen acting like screaming lunatic babies, mm -hmm. it's just like, did, have, can you step back for one second and like think about how people process information? Like, is this how you get the best work out of people? Can you even, like, do an experiment for one second to see if what you think is true is true? Or are you just doing it because someone did it to you, and now you're doing it to the people underneath you? It's like yeah. you know, being a talent agent. You're, you're always like, why is my boss so mean? And then you become an agent, and then you're mean. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, why do we do this? It's a cycle of abuse. <laughs> it's so crappy. But back to the, the distinction between, you know, what men are in restaurants and what women are in, quote, the home. Mm -hmm. That's always been very uh, disturbing to me, and that is not because women aren't as good as chefs and can't run a kitchen as well. It is because to be a chef in a kitchen, you have to make the decision that that's it. Like, that is your entire it's life. It's all-consuming, mm -hmm. right? And I don't think that people should have to make the decision about whether or not they want to have a life and work in a restaurant and be in the food industry. It's totally insane, and it's gotten to this point where people treat food like it's rocket science or brain surgery. Like, at the it end of the day, it's food. It does sound kind of science-y. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's like, it's food. Yeah. People eat it. It sustains people. It tastes really good. But it's food. Yeah. It's like, if we should okay. stop being so precious about it, I think. And so I think that what these women have been doing is, in is incredible. And the backlash to men in a restaurant, women at home, I think, is that a lot of young, smart, cool, educated women who are out there kicking ass don't cook because it is so associated with this antiquated idea of what a woman should do in the home mm -hmm. that we now have all these people that are my age who are lady bosses who are just like, oh, I just never took the time to learn how to, how to cook because that's the stereotype that, like, I don't want to feed into. Right. And it's the I, new, like, I'm not going to learn how to type. Yeah. It's like, well, I'm just not going to learn how to cook. And I wish that I, I would like to remove sex from the issue of cooking mm -hmm. because you can't survive without eating. Right. And you also, it's hard as an adult to feel accomplished day to day, you know? It's just your in pro general. <laughs> yeah, your projects take a really long time and shit's always going wrong and having more things that you can do on a day-to-day -day basis that make you feel, huh, I did that, I accomplished that, I checked that box, I think is really good. Yeah. So trying to 
turn the dialogue from trying to get away from the patriarchal society of, of women cooking, so I'm not going to cook. Like I, cooking I, is drudgery. Yeah, I, I want to try to shift the conversation to being like, cooking is just a really cool thing that we can all do mm -hmm. to feel better about ourselves. Especially dudes, like, don't rely on women to cook because, guess what, we have shit to do also. <laughs> <laughs> learn how to do a few things. It's really easy and I'm going to show you how. Let's cook together. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Your CEO wife has to go to work so you can cook dinner every once in a while. Right. And let's make it fun. I love it. But I would love to see, this is actually, I just did this Food Network thing and one of the comments I got from the, one of the producers was, you have such like a, in, in environments of stress, like it was a competition, you have such like a calm demeanor and you were just laughing and having a good time and usually people are like feeling very cutthroat and throwing things and they get really heated and freaking out. Yeah, and and I I just don't know why people feel that they have to do that. I don't know if it's trying to prove that what you do is harder than what somebody else does or that there's more smoke and mirrors and magic that has to go into food because people want to feel like the barrier to entry to what they do is greater than Those it actually is. competition shows seem very stressful. But they're just fun. <laughs> you know? Did, were you on a competition show? Yeah. What? Well, oh. one of them isn't out yet, so I'm not allowed to talk about it. Oh, the right. other one I was on never aired. So, Great. But it was Cutthroat Kitchen, and it was very fun. But in general, it's just this conversation that we have around food being male-dominated, difficult that you have to make everything from scratch and everything has to be have a, a billion ingredients in it and it needs you know you need to make your own vinegar or you need to <laughs> make your own pickles or you should feel bad about yourself if you are buying rotisserie chickens bought from the store like all of that has been put into this bucket of food content and chefs and this sort of like elitist idea of what food is it's all or nothing and, and p.s you can make vinegar <laughs> yeah. How? Well, you could just keep wine for a really long time. Oh, right. Of course. <laughs> vinegar! I, I'm making some vinegar right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, ooh, that wine smells bad. It's vinegar. <laughs> Let's keep it a little longer. Make it a salad dressing. But I do think that there's a lot of really cool things that have come out of food culture and the rise of the celebrity chef and Instagram. And, you know, we've created a conversation around food as art because of that and creativity. Are definitely into it. Yeah, creativity has like sparked higher than it's ever been. And we have more crazy, awesome restaurants than we ever have before. But this is all pushing the conversation so far in one direction mm -hmm. that I think it's time to be like, well, what about everybody else and everything else and all of the other types of food that are relevant. Right, what are we going to have for dinner? Yeah. And also, why do I have to learn what I'm going to eat from dinner from a guy with a two-star Michelin restaurant? <laughs> why? Why is that the guy that everybody has to learn from? Right. I'm not making an amuse-bouche for yeah. my... Yeah. I'm not going to serve everyone a little a <laughs> teaspoon of... Who knows? Calves liver mousse. Foam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you don't have your molecular gastronomy toolkit, then you can't make dinner for your family. <laughs> yeah, we're just going to order a pizza and watch a cooking show. We're going to order pizza and cry. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so silly. So I hope that I can encourage people to just like have more fun with it. You're bringing it back. I'm trying. I love it. I think you're going to be a superstar. <laughs> that would be great. Is there anything we didn't talk about that you wanted to talk about? Well, I guess one thing that I think is fun about the origin of why I decided to call the show Nosh with Tosh. Mm -hmm. Well, one, I'm Jewish. Nosh is just a cool, you know, word. So Nosh is obviously a, a Yiddish word to snack or to pick or to eat little bits. Mm -hmm. But also another definition for Nosh is, if you looked up in the dictionary, to eat enthusiastically. Yes. Which, when I saw that, I was like, okay, this is definitely the name of my show, and this is definitely a way to describe sort of how I feel about food and what I want people to do with food, because you can't really do something enthusiastically if you don't understand it. Yeah. It's really impossible to be excited about something that you can't fathom what it is and how it happened. So I think there's a combination of things inside of enthusiastically, because it's a little bit of awe, being like, how did this happen and sparking the curiosity to go along with it a appreciation so really seeing seeing food and 
thinking about where it came from and taking one step one step away from just gobbling it up and kind of thinking about it for a second. Like pause for a moment before you shovel yeah. it in your mouth? Like, have you ever thought about where every single thing on your plate came from? Never. You literally could not trace where all the things came from. Well, and I think part of that is conscious denial of we kind of don't want to know where half the food comes from. Yeah. Because if we you don't did, you wouldn't eat it. We don't want to know where bacon comes from. <laughs> yeah. But it's really eye-opening if you just look at your plate for one second and think, where did these things come from? Who, how many people touched this before I touched it? Mm -hmm. How far did it come from? What were the farmers like? I'm supporting their lives. You know, if you actually even just, you can do like mindful meditation exercises with food. If you just take a grape and you put it in your mouth and you don't chew it and you like move it around your mouth and then you bite it a little and it tastes different at different points and it feels different and... Every single bite of food, if you wanted to drive yourself crazy, you could essentially have that experience. Mm -hmm. But I think just thinking about doing things enthusiastically is a reminder that every once in a while, that's an amazing exercise to do. And when you start doing that, you want to cook more because you want to know how these things happened and how they came together. And you're more curious about the farmer and maybe you will spend an extra dollar on something that's organic. And it's not because when a Paltrow told you to, <laughs> Talk about pseudoscience. <laughs> I was thinking about her earlier when you were talking about <laughs> we were talking about coconut oil. That's a whole other crazy thing. But I just think that's a great way to start to change the way that you think about food. It's very personal. And there might be one thing that you respond more to than something else that somebody else would. So eating enthusiastically was very exciting for me. And then also, if you just think about nosh in you know, little little bits and pieces. If you take that outside of food, it's also just like a cool learning experience. Like within the show right now, it's just recipes, but I want to eventually take people to farms and show them how things grow and make some crazy thing that you catch up that you're eating every day, you know, from scratch. So people can see all the different elements of what goes into the food that they eat in a fun way, not in like a make it or you're a bad person. <laughs> Just like, so if kids can... knew that there was tomatoes and ketchup, like, that would change everything. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, yeah, just, that's kind of the world that I want people to sit in for a second. Just curiosity about food. I think it makes life so much richer. Yeah. And, well, and then if you just take, think about, okay, you're looking at the food and you think about that and you're like, oh, my God, there's a plate. Oh, my God, there's a fork. Oh, my God, this chair that I'm sitting on. Like, <laughs> where did all these things come from? Who touched them? And how do I know to sit on this? Yeah. All it takes is like looking at a tomato and I'm like, mm, mm-hmm, remember that thing. And in anything that I buy, I'm thinking about that, which kind of is exhausting, but also I think is important. This stuff is deep. It's <laughs> deep. Noshing. Maybe that's not as fun as the show, but it's a part of it. I think it's great. Thanks. Have you read Feminist Fight Club? Yes. I love yeah. the line. It's something like, carry yourself with the confidence of a mediocre white man. Yes. <laughs> Oh, my God. But that's something, for me, that's been sort of crippling my whole life. I always think that if I'm going to put myself out there, I need to be, like, as good as I possibly can be at it. Mm -hmm. And that stops me from doing basically everything. Right, because so, you have to be perfect before you even begin. Yeah. That was a part of me deciding, oh, maybe I don't want to act. It's been a part of me deciding, like, oh, maybe I don't, all along the way. And even with this show, I was like, well, should I do it? Like, I could have more skills, and I could have more of this, and... I, I have gone more of this private route rather than working in restaurants. And does that make me knowledgeable enough to want to share with people? And I always think about that quote, carry yourself with the confidence of a mediocre white man. If I was a white guy, would I think about this for two seconds? And no. I think the answer is no. No. And it's hard to have an honest conversation about not feeling good enough mm -hmm. to do something while also teaching people how to do things. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, if I'm questioning it, then you're going to question it. But if I don't question it, then you're not going to question it. And I think there is some of that that is true. And that it's finding a balance. Mm -hmm. And that I'm not really sure how to strike that balance. And I still find myself nervous to be like, I have so much more to learn. And I'm always going to be learning. And I'm always going to think that I know how to make something. And then I'm going to find a better way to make it. But, you know, you're 100 miles ahead of me. Like, I have so much to learn from you. Yeah. But that has nothing to do with, like, the internal craziness that is someone that wants to do things as best as they possibly can and give the best information that they possibly can. Yes, yeah, so you have to get over it and do it anyway. Right. So that feminist... But that's a up, whole mind thing. That's a whole thing. That is something that guys don't usually think about. Mm -hmm. That is a constant struggle and something to work past. But also, 
something that I found very interesting in the editing process of this show, which was because I did everything once and I didn't want to look perfect in, you know, one of the days I look much more put together than on the other day. So some of the episodes are way more done up than others. I did that on purpose because I wanted to be like, this is life. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're going to have all the things. Sometimes you're not going to have all the things. Sometimes you're going to look good. Sometimes you're not going to look good. Sometimes, you know, there's this whole range of human life. <laughs> but then when I was in the editing room, and because I only said everything once, not everything is perfect, and because I didn't look perfect, and because I'm not smiling in a lot of the footage because I'm just teaching and being really honest and present. But you're a woman. How can you not be smiling while you do everything? But I honestly was judging myself while I was editing it, thinking I didn't smile enough. Yeah. I am not engaging enough. I didn't look good enough in some of the videos. And that was a whole wow moment for me. I'm like, even though I did all of this incredibly intentionally and exact, I, I did what I wanted to do, now I don't know if I like what I did because it doesn't fit into the box of what I'm used to seeing. Right, and it's against conditioning. Yeah. But you know what they're saying now is the real secret sauce is authenticity. I hope so. And that's what you nailed. <laughs> I hope so. But it's, it's interesting that even, even as I set out with that as a goal, I still had to fight against the instinct to do what I see mm -hmm. and what I think is feminine, yeah. what you perceive to be feminine. So I'm really proud that because I only did things once, I didn't even have the option to pick the smiley cuts. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, it is what it is. But, you know, would it get more clicks? Would I have um, an easier time selling it, perhaps, if I did? Maybe, yeah. But the whole idea was I don't, if I wanted it to be that, if I wanted to make the easiest thing, I would make an 18-decker burger with a low-cut shirt on and try to get as many views as possible. But that's not, you know, that's what I That's not the show you're do. doing. No. So I'm really proud of how it turned out and that I didn't shy away from that. But I, I just wanted to mention that I did think about that while I was editing and have to self-correct and self-check. And, and It's interesting to be so conscious of that process while you're doing it and feeling the, your own resistance. Yeah. And then to have to counteract that. Like, it's such a head game. And then on the other side, because I'm a petite woman and I'm always, like, identified as being cute, mm -hmm. I also was trying, like, okay, well, is this too cutesy? And do I have to, like, tone back my personality here? But it's like... No, you, I just am who I am. Yeah. So there's this whole thing, of, you know, that is trying to sort of counterbalance and also think about what is, who are women in food? And how do I represent in a way that feels authentic and not just let that little voice get carried away to make it what I think people are used to seeing? What do you think a chef is supposed to be? Yeah, but the crazy thing is, like, a lot of women who are on these on cooking programs aren't chefs. Right, but they are often like very smiley, very hosty, very dolled up perfect. with perfect Instagrams. One example is this woman who's very sweet and, and awesome. Her name is Brandy Malloy. And I think she has done really great things for like young Martha Stewarty type women, but it's also the exactly what I saw when I was like, that's what people want. They want someone who's like really smiley and really communicative and incredibly warm and is making these perfect looking dishes so that you can aspire to be the normal version of this magazine version of this person you know mm -hmm. does that make any sense no it does and and I just wanted to not I, I wanted to not do that I actually think you're right because I think the thing that it's funny because I'm I have this presentation now that I'm taking out to corporations but one of the things is your uniqueness is your superpower because you're the only you who had yeah. your history and your perspective and your everything about it. You're the only person who can do your show. And so you have to do it as you. Right. If you do it as someone else, it's not going to be the thing. Yeah. Yeah. But sometimes it can be hard to be you. It's the hardest thing in the world. Because <laughs> it's beaten out of us from day one. Yeah. How we're supposed to be. So finding your voice again and then having the courage to put that out in the world, it's huge. Yeah. But I think it makes all the difference. Especially when there are internet trolls. For instance, I got one comment on a video once when I was doing Cinema and Spice with mm -hmm. my friend. You're going to like this very much. The comment was, even if you were naked and mute, you would still be unwatchable. <laughs> <laughs> Which, 
thanks. It's so funny because if you break it down, it's like, <laughs> even if you were the perfect woman, naked and mute, you would still, still. be watchable. Wow. That's amazing. First of all, sir, you made my day. Yeah. <laughs> Second, Second of, all, of all, who wants your opinion? <laughs> yeah. Like, really? But the crazy thing is this person would watch and comment on every video. So apparently you're, you are watchable. So I'm doing something right. <laughs> like, really, what is the point? Like, that's a lot of effort. Like, let me think of the, the, the vilest thing I can say, and then let me figure out how to comment on this video. Like, really? Come on. Isn't that nuts? Even, yeah. even if you were naked and me, you'd still be unwatchable. I think I should get that on a T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you should. You should do a show that's called that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if I ever do a podcast, maybe it should be that. Even if you were naked and mute, you'd still be unwatchable. That's amazing. Well, for every one of those guys, there's going to be a thousand women going, yes, <laughs> I too can make something. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Yeah, it's good. Thank you so much. Of course, this was really, really fun. You've been listening to The Other 50%, A History of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. I'd like to thank Natasha Feldman for sharing her story. Go find her show at noshwithtosh.com. And special thanks to Jay Rowey, Danny Rosner, and Alison McQuaid for the music. Please find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Podbay. Subscribe and leave a review. And of course, on our website, theother50percent.com, all spelled out in letters. For added features, bios of our guests, pictures, the merchandise, please go there right now and subscribe. You can also follow us on Facebook and on Twitter at Other50% and Instagram at Other50% Podcast. Thanks so much for listening. See you next time.